Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm excited to talk to you about success and growing a business. And we have one of my clients here with me today, Fahad Al-Hatab. Uh, we want to talk about marketing initiatives. Welcome, Fahad. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks, Jane, for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> Did I get your name right? <laughs> yeah, you got it right. You got it right. I've also been a big listener of the show, so I'm excited to be on it. This is this will be this will be fun. <laughs> Very cool. I can imagine that when you are giving out your introduction to people, that you probably need to spell everything phonetically just to make sure that they get it correct. But tell everybody about your existing business model. Who do you help, and what are all the revenue streams from that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, our business is called Unicorn Labs. And uh, fundamentally, what we do is uh, we help we help startups uh, unlock their talent potential. And, and how we do that is we transform managers into leaders that create high-performing teams, teams that help these businesses scale ultimately. And so we live in the space of learning and development and leadership development for these managers. And so naturally, our, our work takes on a few different forms. Our, our, our main bread and butter is we've got a, a leadership training program. It's a 12-week intensive program that we take our managers through. And it's teaching them everything from you know how to think like an entrepreneurial leadership, because entrepreneurial leadership looks different at a startup but also how to create high-performing teams in the environment, what sort of environment you need to create, but also who you need to become in the process. Mm. Um, and so our program is our bread and butter. Our program's got an online course with coaching support, with assessments and with templates. That's, that's really where we spend the majority of our time. And in addition, in addition to that, you know, we offer some upgrades where you get some one-on-one -on -one coaching for key individuals. We do workshops and keynotes for those companies also, where if they're having a big learning day, we come and join them. Uh, we run offsites. You know, this one was kind of fun. We, we've been doing team building retreats. It's been something that has just been a lot of demand from a lot of our companies who want who are fully remote and want to bring their co companies together, want to bring their teams together. And they want to do it intentionally where they're really building teams and they're thinking about the environment that they're creating. So it's definitely taken on different shapes but that core idea of helping you know managers become leaders that create high performing teams that allow businesses to scale is really the space that we're in so good and this is why i wanted to talk to you today because i really do think as you can hear listeners he knows his stuff <laughs> <laughs> he knows of what he speaks uh, but I want to take us back to the beginning. You're Canadian. I'm Canadian. You had a little bit of an auspicious beginning here in Canada. Uh, talk about your, where did you come from and talk about your family's arrival on the scene in yeah. Canada? Yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, my family's mixed ancestry between Kuwait and Iraq. And, uh, after the, the first Gulf war in 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, it created quite a complication for our family. Um, years of trying to figure out where, what place was next for us, Canada, you know, we came to Canada in 1998, um, and, and particularly 1998 on October 30th. And, uh, I recall arriving, let me tell you, Kuwait's hot. Like Kuwait is, 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 is it's a hot country arrived in October 30th. It was cold. Like I, I just remember it just so vividly we arrived. It, I, I always say, I think my dad chose the, the cheapest possible flight because it took us like forever to actually arrive. We were really late on October 30th. We got home. We just just like slept that first night, woke up the next day and we're unpacking all our stuff. And I, I remember I went to my older brother and I was like, hey, like we should go check out Canada. Like we're in Canada. We should check out the neighborhood, go walk around. Older brother was being responsible. He's like, wow, we got to we gotta unpack our stuff first. We got to do all this stuff. So I rally the troops. I come from a big family. I'm, I'm one of six. So I go to my sisters and I was like, guys, we should go and check out the neighborhood. And they're like, no, fat. we got we to gotta do, we got to clean up. Like, it's a new place. We got to unpack all our stuff. So it takes me a while to rally all the troops. It's about like 3, 4 p.m. And I'm like, hey, we're going to go. And I got all my siblings together. My mom and dad are like, where are you guys going? Like, oh, we're going, we're going out. We're going to check, check out the neighborhood. They're like, hey, well, we're going to come. At this point, it's like 5 p.m. It's getting a bit dark. And we all walk out. And all we see are little ghosts and goblins running around knocking yeah. on people's doors. <laughs> it, was, it was Halloween, but like, I'm telling you, we had no idea. I mean, 1998, like you didn't, you weren't on the internet. Like you, there was no that globalization. of You just didn't know this was a thing. We walk out and I'm telling you terrified. I turned to my older brother and I was like, what, 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 what countries, what do we, is this what they do? Is this what Canadians do at night? Like they just, oh my, they go to my, my mom turned to my dad and was like, what devil worship is this? Right. Just like, 
we ran back into the house and and just shut the door. We were afraid. Called my uncle, the only other family that we had here, and he was just laughing hysterically on the phone, saying this is something they do every year. My mom was still on this. This is devil worship. I can't do this. The next day, we're literally peeking out the window at 5 p.m. to make sure this is not happening again. We're just. We're just <laughs> I love that that is your kind of welcome to Canada story. Yeah. And uh, I love that you arrived here and that you have been just kind of doing so well and thriving in this environment. Um, talk about how, how did you even get into speaking? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so the, 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 the story for me starts with uh, a project that me and my friends started while we were in high school. In our high, when we were in high school, um, a friend of mine who I was in elementary school with, we grew up in we grew up in in, in Vanier of Ottawa. So I mean, coming as as newcomers to, to Canada, um, we were in low income low income housing. Our school was typically socially economic low status, and there just you know a lot of challenges in our in our neighborhood. It, when we went to the elementary school during graduation, our principal had challenged us to kind of come back to the community and help out the kids, help out the families. You know, some, it was a nice word and it was not, nothing ever that uh, stood out to me. But I, I mentioned that because in grade 12, it really had stood out to my friend. He recalled that experience and he, he called me up and said, Fahad, I want to try and do a, a camp, a March break camp for kids in our community. We grew up. I told him he was crazy and that nobody was going to give us their children because we're kids. Um, <laughs> And he said, let's try it. And, and, and actually, this is, this is a story I, I tell at the majority of, of, of high schools now. And, and so we started this camp. I have no idea what we were doing out of a school. We, we, we couldn't even sign the legal papers because we were both 17 years old. We had a friend who was 18. Like, we had no idea. We had to fundraise money through bake sales and, and car washes to try and afford to run a camp. We ran this camp during March break for 20 kids. And it was the beginning of my leadership journey, but I, we continued to do it while I was in high school, the last year of high school, and then throughout my time in university. And how it kind of got going was 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 in first year university, my teacher from high school said, oh, can you come share a little bit what you're doing with the camp to like the students? And I said, yeah, sure, I can come. So I went and spoke to our students. And every year I would go back to my own high school and recruit some volunteers for the camp because we needed volunteers for the camp. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, two years in through university, I started getting other teachers that knew my teacher say, oh, Fad, would love to, for you to come to the school and talk to the students about this camp that you started. And so I was just going around just talking about, hey, we did this camp, we did this project, this is how it's working, this is what you should do. Like, we identified something we cared about in our community. And like, listen, we had no idea what we were doing. Honestly, I didn't even think it was going to work. But like, we just put one step forward after another. And like, you'd be surprised, actually, a lot of adults were willing to help us. And like, it was just this fun story. And then I think I'm in like third year university and my brother's guidance counselor, my older, older brother's guidance counselor, my older brother's no longer in school, but you know, I stayed connected with him, calls me and said, Hey, I got your phone number from, from your brother. And I wanted to ask you to come to speak to all our grade 12s. And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll come out. That'd be funny. He's like, how much do you charge? And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? How much do I charge? He's like, well, like, I, <laughs> yeah. I was, he's like, I pay speakers to do this. I'm like, I don't know. I work uh, at the time I was working at a local community center, but I was like, I get paid $12 an hour, $11 an hour. I was like, well, you're having me come out for an hour. I probably need two hours of prep. So I'm like, what, 50 bucks? Like, I, like, I oh genuinely no idea. I, really nice guy. He kind of chuckles, laughs and says, Fad, I want you to go think about it and then get back to me. I have no mentors in this space. I have no idea. So I call him the next day and I said, listen, man, I don't know. So if you think 50 bucks was low, like maybe a hundred bucks. And he's like, I paid my last speaker like $750. And I think you're that quality. I've seen you speak. Like, would, would you like me to pay you that? And I'm like, that's 700. I'm sitting there calculating how much am I getting paid per second? Like <laughs> for an hour talk, it was, it was like, it was a moment of like, whoa, wait a second. I'm used to getting paid hourly minimum wage here. Why, why are you valuing what I'm doing here so much? Now, you know, part of it is I've always kind of grew up speaking and like doing public speaking and, and been in environments where even with community centers, I was doing fundraising. So I had a bit of a natural talent for kind of storytelling and speaking. And honestly, I was just having fun up there. I would tell jokes and I was so close to the, to the youth. I was three years older than them. So I was just the older brother coming in saying, listen, this is what university is going to be all about. And here's how you could do well. And, and it was just so real that I think the message really landed over and over again. And that's, that's kind of what kicked it off. And I, I was able to speak at, I mean, before, before the, the current dismantling of we and, and we day, 
I, I spoke at I spoke at we in front of 16,000 like grade eights and and you know that was an experience that was the coolest thing ever and I got to just share about what we did with the camp and how and that's the story is like, find a problem in your community and try and solve it and you know you'll figure it out along the way and there's going to be some amazing people who help you that's awesome and I love that uh I love that that's your kind of origin story for speaking and I also love the part of what you're gonna pay me seven hundred and fifty dollars? Yeah, yeah. So here we are, where you know you're ten timesing everything and beyond, and I love that. And you've got quite a thriving business. So, number one, how important was it for you to identify not just your lane because you did get your lane down pretty quick, but also your target market you have been kind of going after this one space talk about that a little bit yeah you know it, it i guess it was it was interesting because I'll, I'll tell you what you know i was i was doing leadership development for high school and university students in this kind of education space right how do you find a leader within you how do you be effective in your community a lot of what we call feel good leadership right a lot of inspirational leadership those kind of talks um, and and really owning your own life, and I was I was interested in getting into the leadership space in corporate. But I was like, I, I remember talking to a group in a Little Mastermind, and I mentioned that, and, I, and two people kind of chuckled, and they're like, "Oh, you're young, leadership. What do you know?" And I'm like, "You're right. What do what do I know if I'm teaching a, a you know a corporate IBM leadership?" I'm like, "But I know what my generation needs in leadership, because because I was." I was president of my high school. I was president of the student union at my university. Like I played and, and you know, that's an $8 million uh, organization representing 25,000 students. I play these leadership roles and I, I felt I had certain insights and I was going around the education space. It kind of fell into my lap because I had spent a few years in the startup tech space. I had my own technology a startup. Um, Frank is a phone. It was a little bit of a messy one trying to figure out how to bring a certain mobile technology to Canada. Um, I spent a, a few years working for different startups in kind of marketing and business development while I was doing the youth speaking stuff. Cause I mean, often when speakers are getting going, they have other gigs and other jobs, right? As they keep, especially like in the youth space, you know, it was a thousand dollars a gig, maybe $1,500 a gig, right? And you, you, you did a few here and there. And it wasn't until you know, years into kind of working in the tech space, one of my fellow friends who was a CEO of his company was like, Fadim, having all these problems with my team. I, they're like, I'm spending more time managing the team dynamics and the personalities here at work than, than uh, like actually moving the business forward. Yeah. And it was just over lunch. And I was like, yeah, like, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And we talked about a few things and he found it extremely valuable. And he said, well, are you willing to come to a company and do like a little workshop? And I said, yeah, sure. I'll go in and and I'm like, I don't really have material for this. I'm like, I just, it's the same material I use for like education. He's like, no, no, just try it out. Like what's, it's, it's an hour. Like, you know, I'll get the team together. We already do our Friday socials. Like it'll be a good time, a fun time to do it. And I went in and I did the workshop and they absolutely loved it. And it solidified for me that, okay, there is a space here in intact with, with, with our startups because our startups have young energy that are trying to move really quickly and, and, and tend to be a little messy and you've got to be willing to embrace the mess because you're not going to lead and you're not, you're not trying to create a bureaucracy. You're not trying to create too many systems. You're trying to create some level of messiness, but yet you've got to find how to create high performing teams with really young, passionate talent that can be fiery. And so then I just started like reading about it, learning about it, attending conferences and just doing a whole bunch of stuff for free. Just like while I'm doing my youth education stuff, helping all these different startups and, and network of people that I already knew, helping them with teams, doing some coaching, showing up to their team retreats and facilitating some stuff, stuff that I was already doing for a different market, but learning to tweak it and advance it. And then I started to dive really into organizational psychology and marry the two. And, and that's really how it, it came to be. I think it was a, a marriage of, there's not a lot of people that focus on this at all. In the startup world, as soon as I get on a call with a company and I say, they say, oh, well, there's a lot of leadership development. What makes you unique? I say, well, we primarily focus with high growth startups. Immediately their eyes open up and say, yeah, you're right. I don't, I don't know anyone else that does that. So yeah, that, that's where we're interested in, in the company. Go ahead. 
And the reason why it's so perfect is because you're young and the people they're leading are young. And it's like, of course, why wouldn't we listen to this guy? Yeah. So the fact is that you've got this amazing credibility uh, in that space. And I love that you got so focused. And I really do believe that that's why phew, things are so crazy for you. So, okay, let's kind of break down a few things that you think have been game changers for you and your business. Now, I know you have a lot of systems. You're really, really good at funnels. You're really, really good at analytics. And you're really, really good at team. Um, what of those three do you think has been the biggest game changer? That's actually a good question. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I would have answered it this way any, any sooner than maybe in the last few months, but I think the biggest game changer was the team. Yeah. Um, I think I got a team. Some people would say that I hired a team early because I, I always laugh at this with a lot of fellow speakers or trainers. I say, might bring in more revenue, but my margins aren't as great as you think because I have a, I have a big team because I, I know that I need to build a team that's going to help me build the bigger business the, the, where I'm trying to get to. And, and you know, I, 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 have this, I have this thing on my wall. I always say build for 2030, right? Like I'm, I'm you know, those who are winning today we're building in 2010, right? And 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 so those who are going to be winning in 2030 are have been building for 10 years plus and putting their systems into play. So I really took a very long term approach, and I hired a team. Now the team helped me hone in on my zone of genius, yes. right? Like what am I really good at? And and I would say well, if you figure out what you're really good at, you should micromanage the heck out of that like really dive into it and micromanage the whole process for that. But then other things really let go of it. And that's allowed me to have the creative space to build programs. It's allowed me to play with marketing because I realized actually I'm really good at marketing when I, when I take the time for it, but I wasn't taking the time for it. Um, and, and it allowed me to, 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 to really spend time building the team too, which in itself takes a certain amount of effort and time to create a high performing team. Absolutely. And one of the things that you've done really well is <clears throat> you've solved the problem first and then hired team to implement the solution. You didn't say, I'm not getting enough bookings. You're hired. Go do it. <laughs> Give me more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, you figured out how to do it yourself first, and then you hired someone to help kind of build it and grow it and build the funnel up. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's so important. And, and I think there's, there's, um, there's an argument to be made for hiring agencies that have specialty that can help solve a problem. And then there's an argument to be made for having a staff in-house that once the problem is solved, helps operate it. Often we want junior talent to solve complex problems. And, you know, or like, or, or some people often with speakers, like, oh, I want someone who can sell for me. Like, think about how good you are selling because you're the speaker. You are probably worth 150 grand at another sales company. So unless you're going to buy 150 grand worth of talent to bring over, you're actually lowering the skill set here, right? Like your skill in selling is still better. You can have someone that can, that can set the ball up, that can set the meetings up, that can, that can make sure they're more available than you to get the ball rolling. But at the end of the day, you hit the home runs because of how valuable your talent is, right? Yeah. So, so that was it. So, so our team, our team grew, and and also I was willing to take junior talent. Like we use a lot of student grants. We had students come in, and we give them specific projects. Like you're just going to work on blogs. You're just going to help us create really good blogs that are SEO efficient. Okay, that's it. One student, 15 hours, 20 hours a week. They're just doing one thing. I'm not trying to do a million things. And we get that student in. They're having fun. They're learning. We're learning with them. Next, you know, and, and then we got students to help us with, with our TikTok and our social media. Or we get students to, uh, to help us with, um, uh, we were doing a ton of video editing, right? We needed to launch our course. So we got a student from Waterloo who knew how to edit the video and, and we're getting student grants to help subsidize it from the government. And, and so we've got a team of four or five, six people kind of moving along and really they start to own the business. And it's amazing when they're calling me out on should I need to get better at. And that's when I realized like the, the business has got a team now because it's not just me trying to push the boat forward.
Yeah, and the second thing I think that really needs to be amplified is the fact that you're actually stepping fully into your own leadership role while teaching it to others yeah. and you can take your own medicine. You yeah. can walk your talk in this regard. <clears throat> and I think that's very powerful. And I think that that's something that even if you have a team of part-time subcontractors, people who just bill you every once in a while, I think you really want to be a leader to that team. Make sure that they know what the vision is on a regular basis and make sure that you're coming together as a team to move that vision forward. And yeah. you're, I really love your energy because <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, he's got the hustle, the hustle. And I had the hustle, what? I mean, I've been in this business for over 30 years. And so I want you to just like touch me and <laughs> yeah. a little bit of your energy and all of the ideas and, and uh, what you have moving forward. I feel like I'm kind of in the twilight of my career and I'm starting to like I this book, next book is the last book in the trilogy. There'll be no more books. <laughs> <laughs> down so anyway i love that oh well, we're, we're all learning from you we're, we're learning from the the, the 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 paths that you've paved and and we stand on the shoulders of the giants that have come before us in this industry right like it allows us to to, to really move forward and leap forward because of the lessons that we uh, we take mm, but this idea of building for 2030 is so powerful because eight years out you know what are you doing in eight years mm -hmm. This is our question for our listeners. What are you doing in eight years? What is your plan? And I love that this is your plan, that you're going to have a, probably a pretty large team. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that you think you might have been able to avoid or do differently had you known what you know now. What are some things that you would have been like, yeah, I would have not partnered with that person or anything that you did that you regret? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so when I think of, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm gonna, you mean with team wise or we want to get into marketing? Anything, marketing yeah. Anything. So I'll, I'll get into, I'll get into marketing framework and then, and then I'll, I'll tell you, I guess some of the, some of the, the pieces that we've really learned because uh, I spent almost 180, 200 grand in marketing this last year, like just, you know, doing ads and agencies and just tests, test stuff. So I'll give you some of the lessons we learned from all those tests because, because here's, here's, here's some expensive lessons. Um, so, so um, I, I, for marketing, I always think of marketing in three buckets. So then that way the kind of listeners can, can kind of follow through marketing. You, you have seeds, you have nets and you have spears. Seeds are, your content marketing stuff that you put out there and you're, you're nurturing over long periods of time, right? Like we know plants take two, three, four years to really blossom. So seeds are really the long-term things that you just put out there and, and they might catch something. Nets are kind of specific, but they're a little bit of the spray and pray technique. Sometimes they're nets. Nets could be ads. Nets could be email campaigns. They're kind of, you're putting out a net and you're trying to catch a whole bunch of fish at the same time and then seeing which fish are good. And then you've got spears and spears are very targeted you know, accounts that you're going after uh, ideas. And so I think our marketing strategies should always have those, those three. So for seeds, the most common people do is social media, uh, podcasts and content, right? Like uh, uh, blogging. I would say the biggest lesson for seeds for me was around, We try and generate demand, but we should show up where demand is. Mm. So most of us have a topic we're interested in speaking at on, but we you spend a day on an SEO search engine kind of program like SEMrush or AREFs and just look at what all the people are searching for in your industry. Right. The people, what are the, what questions are they asking? There's already, there's so much data about all the questions people are already asking. Instead, we're out here guessing what questions they're asking. I can, within a day, find out all the questions managers are asking about their leadership journey. And, and so I used to, here's what I want to tell managers. Instead, what, what are managers already asking? 
And and even though sometimes you're gonna you can rank, sometimes it's hard to rank for some of those big questions because Google is competitive. But forget ranking. Take those same questions and just answer them on social media because they're the questions that are top of mind. Answer them on your podcast. They're the questions. So I think for my seeds, I wish I spent more time understanding where demand already was instead of trying to generate demand. And so in marketing, there's always capturing demand or generating demand. There's these two ideas. Capturing demand is when someone's already interested. How do you capture that? Generating demand is to nurture someone to make them interested. Well, most of us are single shops, two or three people. You're not going to generate demand. That takes tons of money and resources, but your goal should be to try to capture demand, which means to find out where it already is and where is it showing up. So I think like extremely SEO optimized content for Google, but then using that same content that is really hot topic for a newsletter, for example, I used to write newsletter, we write newsletter weekly, bi-weekly about stuff that's happening uh, or like different lessons we wanted to teach. But now we only do it on the hot topic of that week and our readership has gone up. Okay. We, were, we were trying to generate demand instead of meet demand where it was. So I think there's an interesting frame of mind that can help us shift. I love that. Okay, so just to recap people, we've got three... Um marketing ideas seeds that's the nurture nets that's kind of the spray and pray and spears and it's all in the name like <laughs> go get this fish yeah yeah um, uh, tell me again the tools that you're using for uh to find the key phrases and what people are asking yeah. So, you know, I, people sometimes make the tools seem very complicated and they can be, it's like Excel, you know, how they, you can use all these macros and all these things, but most of us only know how to go yeah. equal some. Uh, SEMrush, S-E-M, Rush is a good one. And Arefs, A-H-R-E-F-S uh, are great tools. Um, I know Neil Patel has a, has a tool, again, SEO tool. They're good tools and they, they come with little courses and you can get an SEO agency to kind of give you an SEO plan, but it's good for you to understand where demand is. So that, that's, that's okay. a big lesson for seeds. That was the seeds lesson for me is that if, if you're planning for 10 years out, then long tail content, uh, which content actually is searchable. So Google is searchable, YouTube is searchable, and now more than ever, TikTok is becoming searchable. So if you're thinking 10 years out, you want searchable content that can, can, work for itself over the years right and 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 help with that of hiring a student for you know TikTok. if you have no interest in TikTok whatsoever then get some youthful energy into your business and yeah. have somebody come in and help you with that i love that you are hiring students in yeah. that yeah yeah oh and you know what it's fun we get to mentor the students they give you energy they give you good ideas they bear critical of you because this generation is very open, very open with its feedback. And you know what? We want that. Like, you know, and it pushes you to be better than, than sometimes when you're just surrounded with, I don't know, you're an agencies who just tell you you're always doing a good job, right? Like, like there's, you, you need some of that. Yeah. So the second piece is nets. All right. What so nets mean? could be ads, right? Nets are ads. Or if you get a big email list and you send out those emails. Yeah. So here's my lesson for ads. Unless you have a, a B to C. So, so this is an interesting, I think the best product that can sell for ads in, in, in this next is a, is a, is a B to C product that can utilize B to B budgets. So Jane, you're in this space. So it's an individual that will purchase it, but they'll use a B to B budget because it's a business cost. It'll help me return. So an individual buyer who is the buyer themselves, that also um, can use a business budget to, to purchase it. So it's a, it's a B2C sell with a B2B budget. Um, is a really interesting space for kind of these ad content, like to get, to, get, to get courses. That's why the majority of courses that we see online are all about how to make more money in some shape or form, how to build a social media business so you can make more money, how to do that. Because the more money piece is a clear return on investment. It makes it easy. Now, not all of us are in that space, so should you be doing all these social media pieces? Unless it's a clear B2C buyer, which many speakers are not, I do not think that social media uh, advertising should be where they spend their dollars. They should go all in search. So take all that money and just put it in Google search. If you're not doing any Google search ads right now, you're probably missing out on some good business, right? Like it's money for sure, but think about it. If it's $1,000 a month, it's 12 grand a year, you know, but you're probably going to pay four to five dollars a click. You need one sale to come out of that. For most speakers who are listening to your podcast, maybe two sales to cover that entire cost. 
And if you are good, then the lifetime value of that one sale is more than the initial sale, right? If they, you get rebooked or if you get additional referrals. So it might be good to, if you're starting out to eat some of that cost in your first or two years, as you get the rounds going. What did you, um, what was your education in, Fahad? I did economics and political science. So, so the economics piece is coming through because you're yeah. geeking out on all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm geeking out a lot. I, then, I know. And I love it. I love hearing you. That's why I wanted to have you on the podcast because I love hearing you talk about these numbers. And some of you are going to just want to go and take a nap because I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Much. But I'm hoping that you'll just grab onto a piece like, hey, if you're not speaking, spending any money to, to be out there solving a problem, then maybe there's something that you could be looking at. Um, okay. Seeds. We had a one problem. Nets. We've had one problem. What did you do wrong with spears? Honestly, I didn't give it the attention it should. So if there's anything you're going to do, screw your seeds and screw your nets. Mm. Spears identify we, you know, I think it's Russell Brunson calls it your dream 100 list. We identified 100 companies in Canada and the United States based on seven prospecting factors. So here's seven factors that makes them an ideal client for us. And we, I put them all on a list and we're working our way in. So how are we working our way in? I'll go and I'll use LinkedIn sales navigator. And so let's say Jane is a VP of talent at this company. So I'll see Jane and I'll see her mutual connections. I'll click on Jane's mutual connections between her and I, and I'll look at the list of mutual connections and, oh, there's Bob. I haven't spoken to him. I went to university with him. I haven't spoken to him in years, but you know what? I had a good relationship. Hey, Bob, looks like you know Jane. Do, do you know Jane? Yeah, I know Jane from this one time thing. Would you be open to give me an introduction? Yeah, no problem. You're great people. They're loose connections. I haven't spoken to Bob in three years, but he's, he knows good of me and he knows what I've done. So then Bob says, hey, Jane, I want you to meet Fahad. And I just got an intro and I'm getting a meeting without any ad spend and I'm getting, and I'm getting the credibility that has completely changed the game because I realized I was spending all this money trying to convert cold traffic mm -hmm. when you can use your network to that extent. So people think using your network is like, Oh, sell to people in your network. No, no, no. Your network will give you the, uh, the intros to the next. Right. And what we do sometimes is we also just, you know, if we realize there's not a, a, a immediate need for that person. So you and I meet and they're like, oh, we don't, we're not looking at anything right now and say, no problem. Jane, you'd be perfect for our podcast. You want to spend some time together on our podcast. And so what we do is we develop a relationship because they're on our dream 100. So I'm going to keep that person warm and I'm going to engage them in something. So then they share our podcast. They share it on their blog. They're talking about us to their team. And the next time they're thinking about any team development, leadership development, we're top of mind. So when we started really focusing on the Dream 100, I got more booked calls in a month from Spears than any of the other uh, um, uh, seeds or nets. Uh, but the seeds and nets help the Spears because they'll see our ads and they'll see our blogs and the buying journey is more and more online. So there is a full feedback loop for sure. That's why I mentioned all three. But I just, I think after spending so much money on marketing and, and, and advertising, I realized that good, good, a good Spears strategy is truly still the best strategy. Ah, I love this. And I love that you whittled it down to, a, we call it a farm club, a 100 company list. Like these are the people we want to get in front of. And for those of you who have been doing this for a while, hey, when's the last time you really identified like who the dream list is? <laughs> Let's break that down and let's start focusing on that. And uh, yeah, I think using LinkedIn is a great way to. Well, and I think, Jane, often the speakers, people say, oh, when is it okay to do something free or not? So now I have that answer. Is someone from my Dream 100 going to be there? Mm. If the answer is yes, I'm willing to look at something that's maybe pro bono or free because I'm getting advertising. I'm there in front of them. If it's not someone within my Dream 100, no, I'm good. Okay, it's a very clear, not, again, not, not encouraging free stuff, but sometimes when that decision is hard, yeah. is you know, it's more targeted now. Let's add on to that and make, okay, so you have one target in this audience of 500 people. 
let's make your target person be the hero of a story. Maybe you connect with them ahead of time and say, hey, I'm looking for a little research because I'm going to go do this. And now they're going, oh, they're an amazing speaker and they do this research and blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> you make them the hero of your story, like grease that wheel, baby. I love it. I love it. You have so many amazing ideas. Okay, so we've talked about marketing, uh, and I love that we talked about it. This wasn't really even planned from the angle of what did you do wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm always happy to tell people what I did wrong because, like, I do so much wrong. Like, I, I can't even. <laughs> it's constantly like, ah, oh, we fucked this up. Oh, party. I don't know. Sorry, I'm I'm swearing on on this. Okay. Uh, I, like, you just like we just try things and we burn a lot of money along the way. Like, I to caution to people. But also it's a, it's, I say burn money, it's an, ex, it's experiments and you have to be intentional with your experiment. So we're not just burning money without asking, a, having a hypothesis, trying it out and giving ourselves a boundary for when we know it's worked or not. Well, um, talk a little bit about what an ad spend might be for a month for your company, just out of curiosity. Uh, you know, you're building to seven figures and beyond, or actually, I don't even know if you're already there, but, um, Talk about what your ad spend might be. Yeah. So right now, uh, our, our ad spend was hovering around five grand a month, okay. um, which is not crazy high for some of these internet companies at all. Like, um, but I'd say we were there because we're still experimenting. Our unit economics, so you shouldn't put more fuel into an engine that's leaking, right? Like, and so as long as our unit economics weren't perfect, we don't want to add more fuel to it. And so this is why I say we were experimenting because I realized that I might even lower some of that ad spend, put it all into purely Google ads, and then take that $2,000 a month and send a physical campaign to my dream 100. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had this idea of sending them all Rubik's cubes with a note that says, you know, when you look at a Rubik's cube, you think it's easy to solve until you mess it up. And then you're trying to resolve it. It's kind of like team dynamics. You think you know what you want, but it's really hard to actually get there. And like, you know, would love to get on a call with you. Like a little gift that's physical, because then you'll open up the package. You'll be like, what is this? And I'll spend the same amount, but it's more targeted. Yeah. And so sometimes I, I just cut the same money, kind of try it in different buckets. And what about if if once you have the book too, that can be, um, when it, yeah. when is your book coming out? Uh, we, we're, we're probably still a year away. We're probably still a year away. And you know what? It's because actually here's, here's, uh, I started writing the book from what I wanted to teach and what we have in the course. And it still is primarily that. But then when my insight came in around trying to meet demand where it is versus where I want it to go, part of me started to go, well, one second, I should research some of these chapters to see, are these questions people are actually asking? Or is this just my nerdy self and organizational psychology and philosophy that wants to dive into how teams should work in a certain way, but it's so nuanced because it's, I'm so deep into it. And so I'm trying to pull myself out of my own ass by actually looking at where demand trends are. So it slows me down a little bit. And I definitely sometimes have that with this book. It's been like, uh, you know, tippy toeing around it uh, for a while, but it's, it's, it's in the progress and, and we're, we're iterating it quite a few, quite a few times um, because I, I think it's an important piece for me. It's going to be a really important piece. Yeah. I think it will be an important piece. And I think your 100 companies that will be what you want to put in their hand as well as I love a bulky package. I think a bulky package is a great gift. Nobody is getting hardly anything in the mail anymore, right? Except for bills. <laughs> so when you get something that's fun to open, uh, I think that's really cool. When you said the Rubik's Cube, I was picturing little faces on the Rubik's Cube, like of team members. Like team members. <laughs> oh, that could be fun. Yeah. You definitely could or definitely maybe, probably get that. Or maybe it's not team members. Maybe it's their job titles huh. titles or something. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just think that you are um, somebody who definitely has a lot to offer your clients and they're so lucky when they get you in front of them to speak. So what advice are you giving, final question, to new speakers these days? That's a good question. What advice would I give to new speakers these days? Um, you know, I, I think I think I think for 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 all the speakers, we we eventually at one point understand that the value 
the value is twofold. What we create is what value do we actually create? Okay. So it's our content. There's IP it's in the content, but it's also our ability to deliver it. So it's, it's kind of our entertainment. It's our engagement. It's our kind of understanding that, that value. So, so why, why I say that is that I think we kind of put keynoting as the holy grail or like, I want a keynote. Okay. But really the value you're providing is engaging content content that people want to consume and learn from your learning plus engaging keynoting is a form of that. It's a, it's a stand up comedy act. Training is a form of that. Coaching is a form of that. All of these are different forms of that. And so I would say that you want to use all of the, all of the um, uh, forms that have less barriers to access to test your content. So Content should be tested at a coaching level, at a training level, in a book, in a webinar, in a seminar, in a, in a podcast. Once it gets good, it gets refined. It makes its way up to a keynote. But we, we're always placing up the keynote as like, I want more keynotes, I want more keynotes. It's like, well, are you testing new content? Are you playing with new Are you trying it out? And there are other barriers, like there, there's less barriers to entry than, than the speaking, right? Speaking has a lot of barriers to entry if you're a new speaker, right? You need your demo reel and you get on stage and you want a certain fee and you all, and that's good, keep working toward that. But what can you do along the way? I think the one thing that, that I didn't realize made me good, decent, was that like, I did 60, 70 high schools a year. So the amount of reps I got to tell a story and learning to be on stage and comfortability translated to when I started adapting content, but that was because I was doing a $500 gig. A six, I mean, I drove to, I'm in Ottawa. I drove to Toronto and back for a $625 gig and didn't want to get a hotel just so I, you know, to save money. Like, you know, like, like, you know, I put in those reps, but those reps made me better. And by no means am I, you know, I think there's so much more room for me to grow. And I love being with other youth speakers that had, that have stayed in the youth industry because they have so many reps. Some of them have been doing this 20, 25 years in the youth space. And you're just like, because the barrier to entry is a bit less, there is so much more gigs happening. You, you get that scale. So I think for new speakers, Get as many gigs as you can at lower prices to get the, get the reps in and stuff that have less barrier to entry and try and sell some of your ideas online through a seminar, through a webinar, through a, an ebook, so on and so forth, because that's what validates whether your content is good enough, whether people are actually willing to pay you for it. Awesome. Awesome. I, I just think that um, uh, people are going to get some ideas from this. You know, I hadn't thought about taking work from my coaching and putting it into a keynote. Hadn't talk, thought about, you know, taking things that I'm learning from my facilitation and adding it to my keynote. Definitely putting in your time. And we know that youth speakers are road warriors and that <laughs> really paved the, they've really paved their path into the speaking industry and that they deserve to be there. Uh, how would you most like people to connect with you? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the the platform that I'm primarily on. Like, so you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm obviously on Instagram too, and we're doing more and more with TikTok. So if you're on those platforms, you can, you can find me there. Um, but if there's any a, a, a genuine inquiry that you want to engage on, I mean, my website, Unicorn Labs, you can book a call with us directly, you know, and, and uh, that way you can have a conversation. Beautiful. I just want to spell your name for people who are looking for you on LinkedIn. It's F-A-H-D-A-L-H-A-T-T-A-B. Got that? We'll put that. We'll put some links to you in the show notes as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I have loved talking to you today, and I think there's going to be some minds blown out there. I really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you, Jane. Really appreciate it. And for those of you listening in, I hope that uh, you'll let us know if you have gleaned some gold from this one. And with that, we're going to say, see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now.